that. The topic is uh, the impact of epilepsy in the African context. Okay, and uh, our presenter today is a uh, Dr. Musa Watila. He is from Nigeria. He also joined us while the second presentation was going on. And uh, who is Dr. Musa Watila? He's a neurologist at the University of Maiduguri Teaching Hospital in Nigeria. He had an honorary clinical teaching fellow at University College Hospital in London, UK. Dr. Maman Watila Musa, he has MBBS, MFCP, PhD. He's a physician, a lecturer, also a researcher in general neurology, graduated with a PhD in clinical neurology from University College London. His unique area of interest is epilepsy. He was the outgoing African representative to the International League Against Epilepsy, the Young Epilepsy Section, which is a uh, yes, and a member of the International Leagues Against Epilepsy Task Force on research, uh, on research advocacy and uh, priorities. When not glued to his research and clinical work, he is a uh, lot spending time with his family. He is an um, he is a lover of Scrabble. He is a, he's a Scrabble player. He has several academics award and uh, scholarship. So I think uh, we can all join in uh, in welcoming him to the floor to uh, give his presentation on the topic: the impact of epilepsy in the African context. So, Mr. Wa Mr. Watila, you're welcome, sir. Yeah. yeah good morning. Um, please, can you can I, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you clearly, sir. Okay, good. Um, is it possible to share my screen? Uh, because I, yes, I can. Okay. So my, my topic is um, the impact of epilepsy from the African context. Um, and I hope um, Dr. Olushola, you can see my slide. I can see it clearly, please. I can see it clearly, yeah. Good, so um, the topic is the impact of epilepsy from the African context. And when we were deciding this topic with uh, Anat, uh, we, I, I was thinking probably the right word would have been uh, the implication, but um, I'll explain why I ended up choosing the impact rather than implication. Um, and basically, the out, this is the outline. I'll discuss, you know, um, the impact and meaning and purpose um, using business model, um, and then how the impact of epilepsy is felt at various stages. I'll discuss this in the light of the patient and we, the care providers, and um, you know, looking at the. Uh, the point of view from um, the all major stakeholders. I'll look at what the impact of the diagnosis of epilepsy is and the public view. Um, I'll also look at the psychosocial implication and health seeking behavior. And I'll discuss, you know, care structure, um, looking at our own healthcare providers point of view. Um, I declare no conflict of interest in relation to this conference. And all, uh, all the references I've used, uh, I've actually referenced everything. So um, wherever I have used someone's uh, work, I have actually declared that. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that there are all major stakeholders here. We have healthcare providers, we have representatives from uh, non-governmental organizations. And we also have, um, you know, the patients themselves, the people with epilepsy here in this group, uh, telling us their story. Um, so in my way of why will I take this talk? Um, First, I will discuss the implication of the diagnosis of epilepsy. I will discuss the impact of epilepsy on the sufferer. Uh, and then using business models to see how it affects people with epilepsy and how we can use this model to reduce the impact. 
And, and I think that this talk should rather be impactful than, in itself than just give information. I mean, it should influence change. And this is the aim of this. And by the way of introduction, um, we all, it's, it's not new that Africa carries the largest burden uh, for epilepsy. And it is one of the most misunderstood and stigmatized condition. And I think that this is the main reason why there is, it has a great impact on a patient. <clears throat> and it has enormous physical, economic, and psychosocial consequences. And, and this means, you know, problem with educational attainment, professional goals, and social integration. Um, why is there likely a higher burden of epilepsy in Africa? There, there, I mean, there have been studies, our studies, others in, the, in East Africa and around the continent have proposed some of these reasons to be why we have higher burden. And, and this is because of higher risks of, you know, inf infections and parasites. Um, and I'll be discussing some of this in my research paper later in, um, in, a, in the next few hours. Um, head injuries, so before bath, during bath, and after bath. And why am I saying before bath? Um, you know, they, our maternal health care is not that good, um, including during delivery and even after, the, after bath. And subsequently, even ad, into adulthood because of uh, road traffic accidents. And the other thing is a lot of social factors as well. Um, you know, our behavior, behavior to the way we use alcohol, drugs, and the rest. And <clears throat> the other possibility is genetic factors. Now, um, this what's called associative mating. So what it means is that pe people who have epilepsy are more likely to marry within that context, within um, pe other people who have uh, epilepsy, and uh, we think that that genetic pooling might be affecting it. And the other thing is the degree of consanguinity. And this is important because I will discuss that later. And then access to initial investigations, you know, treatment, poor healthcare might be another reason. Then the other reason is that this paucity of case control studies or attributable rigs. So we're not really certain um, because, uh, you know, the studies are not enough. And because of that, we're not sure as to, you know, the reasons. And then the other thing is methodological issues. Some of the issues, uh, some of the studies where there's very high prevalence were done in very small number of, of people. So the one with the highest number, the highest estimate of prevalence in Africa was just done in less than, a, less, in just, I think about a hundred people in a community. So you can see that there are methodological issues in that. And so we might be overestimating the prevalence. Um, and the other thing is socioeconomically disadvantaged persons are more likely. And this was studied by uh, Dominic, Dominicini in, 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 the, in the UK, where he saw that, you know, the incidents in the most deprived fifth, the fifth were two of two, more than two times higher than the least deprived uh, were two times higher in the least deprived fit. So we can see that those who are in the lower socioeconomic class were more than two times higher to develop epilepsy than up there. But there are many other factors and we can see that, but the most important here is CNS infection and parasites. Now, why should we be concerned about care standards for people with epilepsy? Um, this is because of course, the burden is likely high in low, lower middle income countries. And because of the socioeconomic impact, and you know, it has this dragging down effect, perpetuating poverty. And why should we be worried? Because majority can actually be seizure free in, in, the, in the real sense, majority I mean, more than 60 to 70% can be seizure-free on just one drug. It is perhaps one of the cheapest uh, chronic medical condition that can be treated. And so you can see why we should be concerned. Why should people continue to have seizures for 
to perpetuate poverty and have that socioeconomic impact. Why? When we can easily, you know, treat this condition. The other thing is, which people don't usually talk about, is the higher degree of premature mortality. Um, I mean, studies have shown two of two times higher. And this is because people are not properly treated. Now, the other thing is ethical versus equity. Um, we think that, yes, ethical, you know, yes, uh, we, we need to give people who have, uh, who are less privileged something, but sometimes we have to be equitable in that. And this is why we should be concerned about it. Now, why did I use impact rather than implication? Actually, implication might just be the likely consequences. But the impact is a powerful effect that something has, you know, on, um, has on a situation or a person. And so I, I, I decided that I was going to use it rather than, while influence is what we can do to make, th- to make that changes. Now, using this model, you know, this is from, this is a business model um, from uh, Forbes Journal. And um, the study was looking at impact, meaning, and purpose in a business. But I think that it is useful in this context of um, epilepsy and the impact of epilepsy. Now, impact is that strong effect that it has on somebody. Now, meaning to a person is like finding significance to that. You know, why has all this happened why me, you know? And then the other thing is purpose. They, they tend to lack purpose, you know? And they, there's no that socioeconomic pursuit any longer because what's the reason for action? But then we can use that impact meaning and purpose to help people with epilepsy. You can see that on, the, on, your, on the, your right-hand side of the, of, of the screen. But then the other thing is that the arrow can go up by we ourselves helping people with epilepsy using the purpose, meaning, and impact um, model. And so you can see that the impact is that the diagnosis is like a crash to a patient and they struggle for reason. And then they have a different view of life, but then we can do that, we can use that model in the opposite direction. We have, we have some answers. We have a different view. We likely know the reason as healthcare workers, you know, NGOs and, and all the stakeholders. And then the impact is what we do in this instance. And I think that this is something that I'll talk about in, in, in a short while. Now, the impact of epilepsy to a patient is felt at various stages. Now. And that impact, as you can see from that little diagram, is that first, it impacts on the person with epilepsy, and then the family. And do you know what? Including the entire community. You know, we're in in Africa, in the most rural area, we're closely needed people. And so not only so, it will impact, it will trickle down all the way into the community. And I'm sure you agree with, you will agree with me because the first impact is felt at diagnosis, coming to terms with the diagnosis, okay? We're talking about acceptance of that diagnosis. Then it will come to seeking help and seeking healthcare if they ever do that. I mean, if they ever come to seek healthcare. And the other thing is there's an impact on treatment because most, pe- most people with epilepsy would think, or at least their relative would think that if I take medication for a week, just like you would treat malaria for three days, and that's it. But they come to realize, bam, that there is an impact, that your treatment might continue for life or for many years. Then the other thing is schooling. It does have an impact on schooling. Then work, job, livelihood, the other thing is, you know, we have to look at women issues versus men issues in, in that. There's a lot of impact to the women, especially, and things to do with marriage, uh, you know, pregnancy and delivery, spiritual, cultural matters. And, you know, it continues all through life, 
including to the next generation. Because I know African settings where they say, oh, when someone wants to get married, they'll say, oh, do they have epilepsy in their family? You can see that not, and they say, no, he doesn't, but his grandfather had epilepsy. And you can see that all through life to the next generation, they, th that impact is felt. And I think that this is what we in, you know, uh, Epilepsy Alliance Africa are trying to deal with because we can break this impact. We can deal with it, at least using that model. And I'll discuss more about this uh, briefly. You know, I can't go through all these um, topics one after the other. I'll just choose a few and discuss it because I just have um, a few more minutes to go. But as we can see um, from this, a diagnosis, you can see this impact, a car crash, actually, to a person with epilepsy. If this person survives this accident, the impact a person with epilepsy and his family feel is worse than this. It, and that's the truth of the matter. Now, the other thing about, uh, you know, that impact and, and, you know, the diagnosis of epilepsy starts with our own definition. You know, epilepsy is just a disease of the brain. But we, the concept is different because people think it's something spiritual or something, you know, evil or so. And it's just more than two seizures, you know, two or more seizures with two, 24 hours apart. It's, you know, that tendency for recurrent seizures is epilepsy. But then how does, does a person with epilepsy and his family perceive this definition? What do we tell the patient as a healthcare worker? Why, why we must say it correctly and emphatically, why we must explain it to the person. These are the questions that, you know, this is some of the reasons why they feel that impact more. When do we tell people this diagnosis? Where? How do we tell them? These are quite very important and pertinent issues. And, and I think that, you know, they feel more impact with the way we tell them how we tell them, when we tell them, and how the community perceives that. And, you know, um, myself and Najib and others were trying to look at, you know, the terminology of epilepsy and its psychosocial implication. And I think that, you know, we, we have to go back to, you know, our study, um, looking at the terminology of epilepsy and see how that terminology, you know, impacts on the diagnosis and how we in itself can reduce that. And so this is one. Now, the other thing about this type of social implication, which is important, and I think that um, I paraphrase this from Alote and Redpath study on you know, um, social, social cultural and environmental context of epilepsy in Cameroon. And I paraphrased it and it, read, and it reads this, epilepsy excludes persons from their community. It places restriction on performing traditional roles and affects social value. Now, this reduced social value actually challenges being reintegrated as productive and functioning members of society. Now, this I think is how they feel this impact of epilepsy. Now, why? You know, that's the question, 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 question. We keep asking this question, but we think that the most important is stigma and the lack of perception. I mean, it's not properly understood. And the other thing is the ongoing seizures because they're not properly treated. Now, the other issue, <laughs> which I think is why it is perceived as, you know, spiritual or something like, you know, uh, an evil possession is because it is unpredictable. That unpredictability of seizure is perhaps one of the reasons why it's impact. So for example, um, people with, with migraine might have, um, it impacts their life significantly. But what happens is that sometimes they have aura and they say, oh, I'm going to have a migraine and I'm going to stay at home, you see? So if People with epilepsy know, although they might know sometimes, you know, if some of them have, do have aura, they'll just stay at home and say, okay, if this goes, I'll go to work, you know, 
and hide there. But it is an unpredictable situation. And that unpredictability can be lessened by proper treatment. Now, the other way it impacts is health seeking, you know, health seeking behavior. And it is influenced by the sociological aspect of epilepsy. And it's often neglected, you know, people's belief and perceptions. We often neglect that, but we think that that is perhaps the most important and the most useful thing. And in this side, cultural expectations, you know, um, including indigenous systems, you know, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we think that treatment is finite, you know, short term process, you know, and the person gets well and that's it, you know. And so it, if he takes the medication for one month and feels better, you know, the next month he doesn't take it and he thinks it's all right. And, he, and a few months later, he has another thing and say, oh, no, then drugs are not useful. OK, so you can see that, you know, we can this cultural expectation it must be dealt with to reduce the impact. Then the other thing is stigma attached to the condition. And actually stigma may take different forms. And I, I, I don't have all the time to discuss that, but we, it might be discussed in one way or the other. The other thing is, um, you know, the negative impact of epilepsy is felt more because of the widespread stigma. Now, the other thing that affects stigma is also religious and cultural views. And it's actually more prevalent in lower middle income countries. Look, stigma occurs everywhere, but it is more prevalent in Africa because of cultural expectations, people's belief and perception. Now, the other thing is logistics, of course, you know, expense, the cost of drugs, distance to facilities, and the rest. I'll discuss that. Now, in one of our studies looking at health service provision for people with epilepsy in sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at a situational review of what are the possible treatment opportunities. But surprisingly, in the next text, you see that um, some of these treatment structures were just for temporary reason, temporarily, and they and they just bind it up. Now, epilepsy treatment gap is required in some places it's up to 30%. Now, and this is because of lack of structured care, inefficient healthcare system, lack of diagnostic facility, and of course, very importantly, the lack of anti-seizure medications. We, we only have probably three or four if from our studies, three or four medications, the, the, the most being, uh, you know, um, carbamazepine, phenobarb, phenytoin, uh, being the most, Important, important medication around. Although yes, nowadays for richer persons, they can get more newer anti-epileptics and a wider range. Now, the other thing is high cost of treatment. Um, long distance to health facilities. Uh, we've done studies where, you know, up to 20 kilometers to go to the next. And people even would travel a hundred kilometers to go to the nearest hospital. Now, geographic difficulties and poor transportation also impacts and access to treatment. Now, the WHO mental gap was trying to scale up services for mental health, neurological and substance misuse disorder, lower middle income, but it wasn't really enough and it's not enough. Now, in last year, the 73rd World Health Assembly actually called for a global action for epilepsy and other neurological dis dis disorders. And I think that this is quite useful if we can pursue this so that they can be, we can enhance access to essential medicine, identify key barriers to access to, access to affordable, safe and effective and quality assured medication. You know, quality assured medication is another thing because fake drugs is prevalent in Africa. Now, we just looked at, we did a scope, looked at what was available in the past, but what we did was we found that some of them were just, you know, um, demographic surveillance sites, doing research, getting treatment to people, or WHO-sponsored projects. And a lot of these ones provided medication, but some of them have folded up. And so most of the healthcare is usually in tertiary care and secondary care, and very little. And I'll look at some of these models. You know, there have been model examples like the IGBAC, you know, the WHO Global Demographic, the demo projects like Senegal, you know, um, but this 
might have helped, but they're not really functioning well. Now, the other thing I'll, I'll look at is the impact scope. And this is in terms of stakeholders. If this is targeted to stakeholders. And this is business models using you know, a modified pestle approach. Now, to deal with the impact, because I said we ourselves could make impact um, in the reverse direction. When I looked at that model of impact, meaning, and purpose, so first of all, and this is, and that's why I love the uh, Epilepsy Alliance Africa because we we tend to incorporate um, you know, I have research work and clinical fellow job in, in, in addition to my work back in Nigeria. So you can see that, you know, there are models and examples that we can borrow from using both governmental and economic policies for people and reduce that impact on people with epilepsy. Now, the other thing looking at this similar model by, you know, Prakash and colleagues in using that, this model have been used for climate change is that, we must do a stakeholders engagement. And this is what um, you know, the Epilepsy Alliance is doing. Mm -hmm. And we must form evidence-based practice. We must communicate to even the less communicated regions of Africa. And we, we're happy that you know, we could do this anywhere in the world using electronic media. And I'm happy that you know, even the old woman in some parts of rural Africa has a telephone has a radio. And I think that we can use communication to reach out to people for them to understand what epilepsy is, is as a brain disorder, and that treatment can reduce the impact of epilepsy. Now, we must all form strategic partnership. And this will all be discussed. And surprisingly, you know, when I did this modeling, um, you know, modify this modeling from that of the climate change. I found that, that we will definitely discuss this throughout this conference in one way or the other. Then the other thing, apart from strategic partnership, is building capacity. And we've been doing some training, you know, um, highlighting, you know, evidence-based practice in this um, conferences. And the other thing is we need to continue to monitor. We must do continue to do even though a modified personal analysis, but we must do a SWOT analysis looking at our own strengths, our weaknesses, what opportunities are there for us and what threats we have. And, and, and I know that the you know, EAA have you know, undergone through a lot of threats you know, from both international and local chapters, you know, but we, we're able to deal with that. And I think that this is formidable and we can help you know, do that to help reduce impact. Um, and um, I mean, in, in trying to conclude, I think that one important thing is stakeholders engagement. Um, and who do we think is the most important stakeholder? We actually often forget that the major stakeholder is the person with epilepsy. And we often neglect this major stakeholder, which is a person with epilepsy in decision-making processes. This is very, very important. And I, and, I, and I think that, you know, we have people with epilepsy here and I'm really happy because um, we shouldn't ever forget that the patient, the person with epilepsy is the major stakeholder. And we should never neglect them in decision-making. Now, the other thing about health workers is that we, we, we've learned to push down what we've learned in medical school down the throat of people with epilepsy. But I think that there must be patient-directed care and that should be incorporated. You know, when we meet a patient, do we think about the cost? Do we think about the family and psychosocial circumstances? And that should determine our approach. What is a person's income, you know, job and the rest? What are their religious beliefs? Because this is very important in Africa. What epilepsy type? You know, these are things that we need to consider in patient-directed care. <clears throat> and we think that the patient, being a major stakeholder, needs to also involve himself in decision-making. 
you know, patients must say what they feel, say it correctly, say their minds out to healthcare professionals. But I understand that they're limited because you have a consultation with probably a healthcare professional in just 10, 15 minutes. How are you going to talk about this? But I think that, you know, we need to form forums where um, allied health workers, not necessarily doctors or nurses, dealing with that. You know, um, p- people like Turai here have been involved in this engagement. They, uh, works like those from Kawe have done that. And in, 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 in this slide, we've looked at, you know, a model. This is from my PhD t- thesis. And this was modified from, you know, studies by Bumba, Menadi, and Babek uh, and colleagues um, in, in East Africa. You know, that the model is that at least 60 to 70 percent, about two thirds of our patients can be managed in the primary care, close to their environment. And you don't have to use doctors. You can just use allied health workers. But then what is a problem? There's dysfunctional primary health care. There's lack of manpower. But do you know one thing? We don't necessarily have to use very qualified people. Lack of drugs, you know, cost of drugs is still an impediment. Stigma is political will from our government and education, you know, educating our patient is a problem. But we think that this is possible. But then we don't know the number of each, the number of people with epilepsy at this, each of these stages. And so more studies need to be done. But then the true prevalence of epilepsy treatment gap may, might lie between 30 and 100% in, in most studies. But we think, because this is the confidence interval in most studies, but we think that the true prevalence lies between 75 to 100. And most people would never go beyond that primary care. And so they are more likely to go away from proper health care to, you know, local, um, you know, traditional healers. And in our study, we found that more than 75% were, you know, had gone to traditional healers first. Now, the other thing is that at least 20 to 30% can be managed in secondary care, looking at things like general hospitals and cottage hospitals. Now, the problem with that as well is the lack of manpower, the lack of facilities, you know, distance to that facility, the lack of cost of drug and political will from our government. This is another problem with that. And actually, the hard to treat people with epilepsy, you know, the drug resistant ones, uh, might not be more than 10 to 20%. And, and so those are the ones that might go into the tertiary care. And if this model is used properly. And so, but then the problem is lack of expertise, lack of facility, distance of facility, lack of drug and political will as well. Now, but then wherever they are, there should be a continued care in the community, you know, uh, but then it also has the same issue. And then, of course, you know, we always, you know, the first one is identification and acceptance. And I will discuss that a, a bit later on in, in my research paper. But then, and so uh, in, in conclusion, some of the um, topics that we tend to neglect and avoid, you know, uh, which might cause impact, and we need to discuss this, things like premature mortality, driving, you know, working with heavy machinery. And, you know, we need to discuss that this condition is not contagious and then sexual and reproductive issue and then women with epilepsy. And I want to acknowledge this other people and thank you very much for listening and for the patience. Okay, thanks for the presentation.